Hi guys. Um, I'm so excited about this panel because technology is impacting everybody and you guys are kind of in the front seat. Um, so just to get started, because we're going quick, um, what do you guys think are the biggest ethical challenges we're facing as it pertains to technology, specifically when we're looking at Silicon Valley? Joe, you want to start? Gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> you know, I, 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 think, I think a lot of the biggest ethical challenges are around how our society responds to all the, the jobs that we're kind of replacing and changing really quickly right now. Because I think it's a good thing for the world, fundamentally, to make these industries work more efficiently. That's how we progress. But it's all happening at once, and there's going to be 20, 30 percent of our society that, that needs jobs. So I think, I think that's a really tough question, is how we react to that. Yeah, it's, I'd say it's also really to that point, is it's very interesting to think about how we make the world more equal with technology on the rise, is that you've got technology replacing a lot of jobs, you've got technology making jobs more efficient, and a lot of people that typically have been displaced, how do we make the world more equal and how do we make it more fair to a lot of these people where having technology as a place in the world along with allowing people to accelerate, get educated and find better and, and new jobs. And I think that it's led to a lot of challenges. One of the reasons why we have such a hot election today in America is because of that displacement that technology has brought to the workforce and how that can evolve and change over time is something that really needs to be discussed. Um, I think echoing in that, I think certainly we're we're at this moment in history where basically for all of humanity we've been trying to escape starvation and most of our forebears spent most of their trying, time just trying to find enough to eat. And now we're fortunate enough that over the last couple hundred years the Industrial Revolution has enabled more and more people to come out of subsistence poverty. And there's this question which both Joe and Darian alluded to of how do we have equality and how do we, if we have a lot of wealth, how do we spread that wealth around? And then there's a second question, which is a cultural question, which is we have so deeply programmed work as the central purpose of people's existence, this kind of so-called Protestant work ethic. What happens if we actually want a world where a lot of people aren't working? How do we have people feel a sense of satisfaction and purpose in an environment where work is not the central part of their life? Well, a little bit different from that as well. I've been really interested in the moral responsibility that um, designers at a handful of companies like Apple, Google, and Facebook have over stewarding a billion people's attention when they make choices about how this works. <laughs> how this works. Um, and if you're going to steer a billion people's thoughts or attention or choices or their time, how do you ethically think about that? And when does what's good for people conflict with the interests of business? And where does that conversation about uh, moral responsibility actually take place in an organization? Where does that happen on the Google Calendar in a week? And I don't, so if you guys don't know already, Tristan has kind of been coined Silicon Valley's conscience and, and someone that people are beginning to listen to with some of these ideas. So when you talk about software design and how we, you've said we almost need to take a Hippocratic oath. Um, designers need to. Uh, what is inherently flawed about software design, the, the design that makes us love Facebook, love Instagram, um, and what, what can designers do to make it less addictive, especially when there's a business at play? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the unstated problems of our current situation is the business model of advertising creates this unbounded incentive to hook people into spending time and to bringing them back. So these, you have good intention people who, whether you're building a meditation app or a news website, CNN, or uh, Facebook or Snapchat, you basically still have to hook people into coming back. And so the attention economy creates perverse incentives that as each person tries to maximize attention and Netflix adds the autoplay the next video feature and then YouTube adds the autoplay the next video and then Facebook says we're going to autoplay the next video, it becomes this arms race. And so uh, I always think there's no evil people, there's just simply perverse incentives. So how do you align the incentives so that instead of competing for attention, uh, these different products are competing to help us spend our time well or help compete for fulfilling human values? I'm, I'm curious, like, how many people in the audience sometimes feel addicted to your phone? How many people, like, check your email and then look down and 30 seconds later and, like, you fucking checked your email again and you have no idea why you yeah. did? That's me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing I think is interesting is we as, as societies, we, we choose to regulate things that are addictive. We regulate cigarettes. We regulate drugs. People are starting to regulate sugar. I just voted in San Francisco, and I voted in favor of the sh uh, sugar beverage tax. And which I'm sure, I don't know actually what Joe thinks about that. 
Um, me and Joe are political foils sometimes. Um, and, and I don't know what the right solution is, but we have these products that are clearly addictive. I've chosen over the last year to start keeping Shabbat, where I don't use my phone for 25 hours a week. And it's like a totally bizarre experience. It's like living in the 90s, where like, I have to like make plans, and like I can't flake on people. But I find that by the end of that day, I have so much more energy, because I've been so much more present and so much less distracted. And realizing how much we've designed these things, where we just reflexively and unconsciously are using them. It, but, and I have to push you guys on this, though. You look at Silicon Valley, a lot of dudes, a lot of young ones, and they're creating these products that are going into the hands of billions and they're cr impacting culture. You don't have philosophers in the room necessarily. You don't have as many women in the room creating some of these decisions. Um, so, you know, technology, they might have a blind spot when it comes to having some empathy, when it comes to creating addictive products. So, do we need to diversify Silicon Valley? Do we need to bring, uh, should every startup board have an, someone in ethics on it? What's we, the solution? We, we actually did hire a philosopher in residence at our fund because it's stuff that comes up a lot. So that's a fun position to have. But I, I guess I'd step back and say, a lot of us are building these technology companies. And one of the biggest questions is how do you get really talented people to all want to come work on a mission? And so I think the majority of these companies we're working on nowadays they have a story about why this is really important for the world, and it's really hard to fake that. You can't get people to give their lives towards something that, that anyone really thinks is fake. So, so I think the majority of the companies we're investing in, we're doing so because we really do believe this is something that great, smart people would want to help, would want to push forward, would want to believe in. So I, th I think there is a positive reinforcing thing where a lot of these are, are, are there for a reason. Now that said, I do think there's some really interesting questions in the consumer media companies especially where it's unclear what's good for the world and what makes money and how those two interact. That's a really tough question. Yeah, and I, th I think also you're starting to see a lot of shifts in Silicon Valley. I mean, you have Mark Benioff hiring a chief equality officer, which I think is one of the smartest moves we've seen in the past year. But, you know, it really focused on how do we make sure that technology empowers? I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs have created this, these amazing platforms and leveraging those platforms to make sure that the world is more equal and that people can take part in the workforce and that we're actually driving positive results rather than just getting people more addicted to their phones is something that I think can really be a change in Silicon Valley. So a lot of these entrepreneurs, as you talk to, that may have a lot of power are using it in the right ways. And I think that that's something I want to see more of in the world. And yeah. Darren, you were um, the first intern at Facebook, right? One of the first. He, lo he, he loves there. it when you talk about that. That's his favorite <laughs> word. All right, OK. Uh, so you no, I, I appreciate it. Let's talk more about that. <laughs> you were there back in the day, um, early conversations with Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, when you guys were building out the company, were there conversations uh, about ethics and user behavior and, and this type of thing? And then I also want you to tell me, because you told me backstage that you had had a really interesting interview with uh, Sean Parker, and he had said something to you that I think still kind of holds true to this day if he could ask the same question. Yeah, it's, it's uh, so, so when Sean was interviewing me, I, I was very young at the time. I think I was like 17 or something. And um, I, I, was, I was pretty nervous. And he asked a question that's been burned in my mind for the past 10 years. And what he asked was, let's say that Facebook is 100 million users. It was only about 2 uh, million unimaginable. users Unimaginable. Unimaginable. That was an unimaginable outcome. Um, it's 100 million users, not, not two as it is today. Is Mark Zuckerberg the most powerful or the least powerful person in the world? And, and that's a really good question, is that, you know, should entrepreneurs that have big platforms, should be they, they be forcing change or they should be shepherding change in the direction that people want to go? And I think that most entrepreneurs, all, all of them today that run these big companies are doing a very good job of getting people to have a voice, to share information more freely and make the decisions for themselves, not forcing a decision, which is something that's really interesting. And Facebook's done a fantastic job of this, of empowering people to have a voice, to make great decisions, and to really communicate and not be shut out by society. And that's led to better outcomes, that's led to more peace, to make sure that we actually have progress in the world, which is really, really interesting. So I think that that question of, are people that control these platforms powerful or not powerful, is still a good question. Are they more powerful because they're shepherding change, or are they more powerful because they don't do anything to force change? It's still an interesting topic, but as long as we continue to do the right things, like in, embrace equality, give people a voice, allow for the free flow of information with these large platforms, whether it's an enterprise software or a consumer software, we're going to see positive outcomes in the world. I mean, but do you think Facebook, I mean, Facebook is now in this incredible position to have mass influence. I mean, even look at the election 
um, and, and what's kind of come of it. Do you think Facebook has uh, been as ethical as they can do? What are the interesting issues you think Facebook should, should be asking? I, mean, I think one, one interesting question, and like, uh, Ezra Klein wrote a good piece on this a couple of days ago about the role that uh, political conversation on Facebook has had in sort of the rise of Donald Trump. And, you know, because there is the, just the, and I don't think it's through any kind of like conscious design, but because, you know, you tend to hear from your friends and the way that the conversation flows on Facebook, you tend to have these sort of increasingly polarized and kind of strident positions. And it's not a forum that leads for people to kind of come to empathetic, empathetic mutual understanding, but rather you're talking these sort of like very short, like back and forth that I think one interesting challenge is how do we use technology to promote empathy and understanding not to lead to like more and more division? I think when I think about the ethics and for Joe's point earlier, um, that these companies want to do good and uh, I'm, I've never met someone in Silicon Valley who didn't want to try and make the world better. Uh, there's, <laughs> throughout history, uh, technology, I mean the world has been littered with, with people who are trying to do good but just couldn't see through their own thinking. So I actually think when you think about ethics, the deepest question is can you question your own thinking? Can you see your own blind spots? Can you actually take the opposite perspective of every perspective you have, be your own internal contrarian and ask the exact opposite question of your own last statement? Um, diversity is one way of, of simulating that. But, um, you know, I, I think, for example, when you think about Donald Trump and, and the media, uh, if you're trying to exploit a system, what do you do? You try to find the failure mode or the vulnerability in that system. So one failure mode of attention is, uh, or of, of Facebook, is that people share stuff just because it gets their attention and it makes them share stuff. So if you're Donald Trump and you're sitting there like a magician does, and you think, okay, what could I do? What could I say? Are you channeling your share? Donald Trump right now? I'm, yeah, right, exactly. Uh, no, no, definitely not. Uh, definitely not. Um, but if, if you would say, what could I say that would basically get the most attention? And so there was an article written, I think it was pretty accurate, that he's like a runaway AI that basically just says whatever it takes to get attention. <laughs> and there is no such thing as a, a truth. There's no internal compass about what's real or what's not real. It's just literally running away to say whatever gets people to click or share. And it works because it's exploiting the Facebook's vulnerabilities of, of how people share information. So it's really like a, a social psychologist who knows how to get information through pathways. Hmm, that, that's interesting. I mean, what, so what's the, what is the solution? Is there a solution in design? I mean, what's the, what is the next phase of this? Well, well I, think, I think for a lot of us, this is why we're really focused on some of these enterprise challenges, because I could see a process in healthcare, and I could tell you, here's why it's less efficient, here's why more people are dying, here's why it's wasting money. I could do that in finance and logistics. These are the areas I've built companies in and invested in. Media and consumer is really hard for me because I'm not really sure what the answer is. And at least that's one of the reasons I'm not as active in it. I think it's a really tough question. And your, uh, your investment fund, I mean, it's focused on kind of these, some of these ethical questions and, and investing in companies that will make the world better. What are some of the enterprises you guys are looking at that are kind of ripe for this type of disruption? Well, I mean, I think we were talking earlier a bit backstage about like how healthcare is a big problem and it's gone up in, in price. I mean, just fixing healthcare and making it better is something technology can do. It's, it's a big deal, but I'll go to another fun one is the Hyperloop. And in Hyperloop one, 1 is one I've been pretty involved with, and people probably heard about the Hyperloop. It's like a much faster high-speed train. The thing that's most exciting to me about Hyperloop is its ability to address economic inequality by having better access to cities. And so one of the worst things in our economy right now is people can't be part of cities' economies because it's too expensive. San Francisco being an example of something really expensive. You build a tunnel in a 200-mile you know, 200 mile route where you can live outside the city, get there in 10 minutes, suddenly you totally change the economy of the city, you give access to people who are less well off. I think, I think it's a big deal. So there's a lot of things like this that I think help the world a lot. And I want to just ask you really quick about, you've had, um, you've known Peter Thiel for years and we can't talk, we have to do a Peter Thiel question when we're talking ethics. I know Peter Thiel has um, ethically, uh, he's become a more controversial figure. You've known him for years. A lot of folks in Silicon Valley have commented on it. He funded a lawsuit secretly that ended Gawker. Um, and journalists and a lot of folks were saying, is that ethically, is that the right way to spend your money if you're a billionaire in Silicon Valley? So it brought up this question. As someone who knows him and who's known him for years, I mean, what's your take on that? Uh, it raises a lot of interesting questions about First Amendment rights. Sure. So, so Peter... Peter and I obviously don't agree with each other on everything, but I've always found him to be a very intellectual, very ethically minded person where he, he thinks really hard at a high level about what he believes in. And I, th I think he really believed 
that these people were doing damage overall and were not respecting what he believed was the line where privacy should be in our society and that if he could if he could get them in trouble for having crossed that line in a legal way, that was something he was, he was proud to do to discourage people from having that kind of business model where they did abuse privacy that way. So I, I think he has a very consistent position and he really believes in that. I can see how it's really scary to people that a billionaire would be able to throw around their weight and affect these things. But we have to remember, it, it, was, a, it was a law that's on the books that exists that, that, that he prosecuted them with. So, I mean, if you really want to fix the situation, Let's have tort reform. Let's make lawsuits not so expensive and not so ridiculous. And I think that would be the better response. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say also that if you re to really understand the insight, there's there's a it's a lot more complicated than just he's for or against an issue. He really thinks about it critically. And there's a book, you know, Hillbilly Elegy, which I think is a fantastic book that actually Peter had part uh, had a part in, and it really explains the thinking around why there's this radicalism in the United States, why there needs to be some change in the government, why we why we really have all these complexities that don't need to exist in the government, and why Peter is advocating a certain way. And that'll give a lot of insight into his thought. You also have spoken about when you talk about regulations, and you said uh, to me earlier you think there should be almost like a Geneva Convention for, for technology. Can you explain your thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think today is a very, very interesting day in the sense that is Russia going to hack the United States elect election system? You know, is Putin going to go that far? And try. Is, is it rigged in the wrong way or in the, w in the way against Hillary Clinton? Is it rigged, you know, for Donald Trump? And that's a really good question that I think people should ask. Should there be punishments for people or countries that actually infiltrate an election or actually have that level of espionage? We haven't really done anything around, the, around those things. And the impacts are just as real as, a, as almost a real war. Yeah, and so, yeah, I mean, I get really frustrated when China openly steals, you know, secrets from every Fortune 500 company in America. And because we want good relations, we're just afraid to say anything, afraid to put any punishments in place. I mean, when we deal with like, Chinese merchants you know, on Wish, we have 250,000 merchants, and if they do something wrong and don't behave, we gamify it, and they, they can sell less because they're doing something wrong. I think it's ridiculous that countries just get away with, with doing this willy-nilly. So I, we do have to think more about that and, and have more courage from our leaders in thinking about that. Um, and I know we got to wrap soon. If, if we were looking at Silicon Valley as kind of like a college, and, and one one company needed to take ethics 101. One company really needed to focus on <laughs> ethics. You guys are familiar with all the companies. You're involved in a lot of the companies. Which company needs ethics 101? That's not a winning question. <laughs> <laughs> a Twitter, I think. Why? I, I mean, I think that if you look at the amount of bots that are out there on Twitter that shape and affect people's opinions, it's out of control. It's very easy for a Donald Trump or for any campaign to basically create a bunch of fake accounts. And, and, and on the same side with Twitter, I would agree with Twitter, actually. It's very inconsistent, it seems, to a lot of us, who they ban, how they choose to ban them, what the rules are for that. A lot of it seems very politicized right now. Uh, I, I mean, I disagree with a lot of the far-right noise people make on Twitter, but who they choose to ban, what videos are, are, are blocked with links, it's, 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 it seems very arbitrary. So I think there's a really big question there where they may be abusing their power. I mean, and also the question of harassment, right? These are questions that when you talk about having responsible designers creating software, these are questions that I, are people thinking about when they create these technologies. Um, and who's responsible? Is it the tech companies responsible for creating the platform, or is it also you know, users kind of sign up for this? I think the, the issue is that most users have no idea the incentives or the internal sort of goals of companies. So when they use a product, they think of it as, we have this narrative that technology is neutral, and it's up to us to, use, to choose how to use it. We don't realize that, again, in the case of the attention economy, there's 100 or in some cases 1,000 people on the other side of the screen whose job every day when they go to work is to find new ways to get you to use it. I might add to the list Snapchat, because I think that uh, there's lots of ways that Snapchat, especially with younger populations who, who use it and are not aware of the techniques that are being used against them, uh, like the streaks feature, which is basically a, from the playbook of persuasive techniques, to basically hook you into not losing this streak of 150 days in a row you've messaged someone. It's very effective, and it's driving a lot of kids really, really crazy. And Joe, I'll let you have the last word. Are you optimistic about the future of technology? Yeah, I, I think I'm an optimist in general, but I think that I think there's, there's this sense, that especially with the election today, that there's almost this kind of like impotence, impetus, impotence in taking on like big problems. Like, think, you know, like, you know, we see like inequality rising, like no matter how the election in the U.S. goes today, across the developed world, there's a huge amount of frustration of folks that have been hurt by globalization. And no one seems to be really addressing that at its core. 
And that is going to keep getting worse and worse and worse, and it's going to express itself. You're seeing far-right um, nationalist racist parties emerge across the developed world. And that is a huge problem. And until, like, the core issues there are developed, you know, I think often those of us in technology can be a little, in a little bit of a bubble where everything, like, for us is amazing, and so many folks are getting left behind. And, and I think, you know, like, whenever it happens that self-driving cars you know, become ubiquitous, you're going to see in the U.S. alone 15 million people lose their job in the matter of a very small number of years. That has never happened before. It used to take an entire generation for technology to replace a set of the workforce. And I think a lot of companies are like, well, that's not my problem. And if companies don't take responsibility for that, there will be like revolution in the streets. And so I think that we all need to really think seriously about how this affects, uh, affects people. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Glad you guys are thinking about these things. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thanks.